And I, I, yep, perfect, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Monday. Thanks for joining um, this quarter's Milwaukee Implement HF collaboration call. Um, most of you probably are familiar with me at this point, uh, Lynn Serdinsky, um, the former lead for um, Implement HF in Milwaukee. I think most of you are aware I've taken a new position um, within Implement HF um, the end of August, I think, um, and I will still be working with all of you just in a different capacity, um, leading Implement HF with the working with all of the quality program managers across the seven regions. And I'm super excited to turn you all over to good hands with Ann Mull Delwadi. She is the new Implement HF um, program lead for Milwaukee. So Ann Mull, do you just want to introduce yourself to the group and um, just say where you're from and what you've um, been doing with AHA for the last number of years. Absolutely. Thank you, Lynn. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Anmol Dalwadi. Um, I am based in Houston, Texas, and I've been at the AHA for four years focusing on um, different initiatives. I've helped with KDBH, Stroke Systems of Care, um, and Transitions of Care. Um, I've helped... Um. Sorry. Miles position and uh, do you what pack? Thank you. Um, I've also worked on the four A of uh, four F's of AFib, and now I have transitioned into this role in November um, as a pro program consultant for Implement Heart Failure, specifically working with this region. Um, I'm very excited, and I hope to. Um, set up some uh, calls with Lynn, I, and yourselves um, just to get to know you a little better. But thank you, Lynn. Thanks so much, Ann Mull. We're super excited to have you on the team, and I know that um, all of you will really enjoy working with her. Um, I skipped over our agenda, so I'm just going to go back real quick. Um, Sorry, Emma, thank you. Um, and just go through what we're gonna be talking through today. And then we wanna definitely open it up to all of you to do some introductions. We have some new um, collaborators on the call today. Super excited to have them with us um, and really excited for Animal to meet all of you too. So we will go through some introductions and then a participation update. We will spend the majority of today talking through um, using data to drive impact specifically in Milwaukee. So we'll review baseline data through quarter two. We will talk through some model and challenge share sharing. You'll see um, where we've made some great progress and some of the adherence to guidelines and where we have some room for improvement and want to spend some time um, and open discussion there. We'll talk a little bit about our healthcare network and then a patient survey challenge that we currently have going on where you have the opportunity to um, win additional patient discharge kits and guideline booklets. So we'll talk through that and then some resources and upcoming events. So now we'll just take a minute, um, maybe Dr. Salzberg, we can kick it off with you to start us off with introductions. Um, and then we'll turn it over to the rest of the group. Anyone that's comfortable coming off of mute and sharing um, your name, title, and organization. Well, good afternoon, Lynn, and thank you for uh, kicking this off, and I'm all for your leadership, which I'm uh, looking forward to for the life of this project going forward. Uh, my name is Mitchell Salzberg. I'm currently the medical director for ProHealth Heart and Vascular, uh, former member of the Medical College of Wisconsin for a number of years, and have been thrilled to be the Metro champion for the American Heart Association for I don't know, I've been three or four years already, but it's been a great it's been a great run, and Lynn has always made it easy. So if others want to uh, come off mute, it'd be great to get to know people who are on the call a little bit. It's always nice to know who's out there in the audience. Uh, this is Jennifer Niederstadt. I'm a nurse practitioner at Pro Health, currently working with Dr. Salzberg. Hi, Jennifer. Well, <laughs> welcome, Jennifer. We're super excited to have you on the call. Who's brave and wants to come next? I'm just going to go down the line and call in. Yeah, don't be shy. We'll, 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 call, we'll call on you, too. So That's what I'm going to do just to keep it organized, Dr. <laughs> Salzer. I'm going to call in people. Okay. So, Cindy, right. you're next on my list. Cindy Burdett. Uh, yeah, Cindy Burdett, um, Aurora Summit. And Thanks, I work for, in quality data. Thanks for joining, Cindy. 
Gail. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Gail Pellin. I'm the clinic manager for heart and vascular for um, Freighter, Menominee Falls, and our Brookfield Clinic. Awesome. Thanks for joining, Gail. You're welcome. Kim. Yes, I'm Kim Kosky. I'm right now I'm the interim heart failure abstractor for both Lakeland and Burlington hospitals. Thanks for joining, Kim. Linda. Uh, Linda Burnett, fighter abstractor at Freighter Hospital. Thanks, Linda. Diane. Hi, it's Diane Penskowski. I'm the director of cardiovascular quality at Advocate Aurora Health. Thanks, Diane. Carrie. Hi, I'm Carrie Persinger. I'm the data abstractor for Aurora Medical Center, Washington County. Awesome. Thanks for joining, Carrie. Adam. I'm Adam Schultz. I'm uh, one of the advanced heart failure cardiologists at uh, Aurora St. Luke's. Great to have you, Adam. Thanks for joining. Donna. I'm Donna Stadrava. I'm a quality improvement coordinator for Aurora Medical Center Kenosha, and I also abstract um, heart failure for uh, Mount Pleasant. Thanks, Donna. Tanya. I'm Tanya Scarvin. I'm a CHF nurse coordinator um, at a Freighter Holy Family in Manitowoc. Awesome. Thanks for joining, Tanya. Excited to have you on the call. Tracy. Hi, I'm Tracy Shook. I work with Ascension All Saints. I'm one of the inpatient heart failure educators, and I also do the data extraction for our heart failure clinic in Racine. Thanks, Tracy. Glad to have you on the call. Mary. Hi, I'm Mary Wanta. I am a registered nurse that um, works primarily for St. Luke's South Shore and St. Luke's and Sinai that I do abstraction inpatient and the post-acute. And then I do the post-acute for Grafton and Hartford for Advocate Aurora. Thanks, Mary. Did I miss anyone? Well, thank you all for joining. It's super exciting on um, the last couple of times we've seen some new folks join um, and it's really exciting to have someone from every health system across Metro Milwaukee on the call today. So thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy weeks um, as we get ready for the holidays and you're in the midst of taking care of patients, some of you during flu season. So we, we really appreciate um, all of you being on the call today. And well, if you could just go to the next slide. Thank you. So just wanted to give a quick update um, on Metro Milwaukee Implement HF participation. Uh, we currently have 17 hospitals that are um, participating in Implement HF and um, one that's in progress. So super exciting to see all of the engagement across the health systems. Um, again, can't thank you all enough for your dedication to improving heart failure care. In addition to hospitals, we also have two skilled nursing facilities, um, one community paramedicine, and then uh, we still have an opportunity for outpatient participation. And Sarah, I see that you're on. I don't know if there's anything you want to add there. Otherwise, I'm I'm happy to continue moving along. Hi, Lynn. No, I don't have anything to add, but thank you. OK, thanks, Sarah. And then we can dive right in. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Salzberg to go through um, our Metro Milwaukee Implement HF data. I would really just ask all of you, if you can, to, um, as you have questions or anything that you've had a challenge with that you're seeing in the data or that you've had a success with, we would love to have some conversation around this part. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, to doc Dr. Salzberg, and then we'll have some discussion. Uh, thank you, Lynn. So uh, for most of us who've been here before, some of this data will be very familiar. We're going to update where we have been and what our opportunities still are. For those who are relatively new, uh, we'll take a few minutes to, to review the data elements that we are monitoring carefully as part of this initiative. Um, on the inpatient side, you'll see a series of measures, uh, including the use of an ACE Arbor Arni at the time of discharge. And the details of the metric are listed to the right, but that includes a percentage of the patients who are receiving these therapies. We're also specifically carving out the use of ARNI in 
uh, HIPRs at the time of discharge. In addition to evidence-based beta blockers, and again, as a reminder to this group, there are three FDA-approved guideline-based beta blockers that are being tracked, uh, bisoprolol, carvedilol, and metoprolol succinate. Uh, and we you know, still see uh, some opportunities in the community to, to help uh, those who uh, maybe aren't familiar with the uh, evidence-based beta blockers to ensure that they are transitioned to one of these three agents prior to discharge. Use of aldosterone antagonists at discharge with those patients with HEFREF, SGL2, SGLT2 inhibitors for HEFREF patients as well. In addition, a composite score looking at the use of quadruple therapy, which increasingly we have a strong focus on moving our patients with lower ejection fraction to the combination of an ARNI, an evidence-based beta blocker, an aldosterone antagonist, and an SGLT2 inhibitor. Ideally, these can be started prior to discharge, uh, which maximizes the chances of continue using these medications uh, beyond the hospital stay. And then finally, it, the health-related social needs assessment, which is the percent of the patients who are discharged from a facility who've had documentation of a health needs social needs assessment completed during, at some point, the admission. So if we begin looking at the data, comparing uh, quarter one to quarter two data, and we look at our baseline, uh, for uh, Implement HF in Milwaukee, we can see that uh, we've historically done very well with ACE, ARBOR, ARNI usage on the inpatient side. They have slipped slightly uh, and while we're still above our goal of compliance. Uh, we've lost just a little bit of little bit of traction with this one measure. Uh, for the use of beta blockers, we've done extremely well. In fact, they've gone up and are at the 99th uh, percent now compared to where we were at baseline of 94 percent. So really good progress uh, with that metric. When we look at aldosterone antagonism, and I can remember a time when we were much, much lower than this, we're still not at goal, uh, which is uh, approaches about 90%, but we are uh, making some progress with improvement. Uh, likewise, the use of an angiotensin receptor neprolysis inhibitor discharge, making progress, but it's still below goal. You can see that the, the threshold is approximately 60%, and we're currently at 49% for this metric. In terms of a health-related social needs assessment, we have made substantial progress. Uh, from baseline of 3% up to 53%, and again, well beyond where the goal of compliance is, so congratulations on that metric. Quadruple therapy also making a you know, tremendous progress, uh, moving from 11 to 43%, and also you know, recognizing that we're much above the target threshold of 30% currently. And then, in addition, the use of an SGLT2 inhibitor discharge for low ejection fraction patients up from 7 to 30% and now exceeding goal. So, overall, I think we are doing exceedingly well. Opportunities just to review again aldosterone antagonism and the use of an angiotensin receptor neprolysin inhibitor at the time of discharge. When we compare baseline data, uh, quarter two data, and then begin to look at it in terms of this, the um, Implement Heart Flare 7 region data set, uh, more opportunities uh, emerge. Again, if we look at kind of the gray bars in particular, uh, ACE, Arbor, Arni, we're lagging the um, 7 region performance most recently at 94%. Um, in terms of beta blockers, we're, we're kind of leading the pack, which not surprising given our 99% uh, kind of coordination on that metric. When look at aldosterone antagonism, we are making you know, progress, but still lagging behind uh, the seven region uh, level of 74%, uh, being at 64%. Also lagging on ARNI at discharge, 49 compared to 63%. Health related, health related social needs assessment, 53 versus 66. And we can see quadruple therapy uh, is a little bit closer, 43 versus 48%, but still lagging somewhat as we are with an SGLT2 inhibitor at discharge. So historically, uh, we have been doing exceeding well and often have been leaders in the seven region data. Uh, and I think in you know, this case, we've perhaps slipped a little bit. Uh, and maybe we'll use this as a call to call the arms for everybody to uh, relook and, and engage with others to figure out uh, both inside and outside of our region how we can bring these metrics up. So as we look at it, you know, again, doing very well with ASR Barney, uh, leading the pack on beta blockers, but opportunities across the remaining five metrics that still exist for uh, the Milwaukee area. When we look at the percent changes on the in, on the specific inpatient measures, again, a slight dip in ACE Arbor Arni, minus 1.2%, positive gains across the board. Um, and we can hope to see 
that this data will continue to mirror and perhaps exceed what we're seeing um, across the other seven regions. Um, but again, some you know, really profound improvements. Again, I don't want to minimize, even if we're not leading the seven regions, we're still making substantial progress. Uh, and again, I'm particularly impressed with things like quadruple therapy, which is a relatively recent concept in terms of the, you know, the use of these four medications. It's one that resonates in the heart failure community, but I can speak from at least my experience, and I'm eager to hear others, if you're seeing this among other general cardiology communities that people have embraced this idea that you know, these four drugs have extraordinary value uh, when it comes to these patients. So again, good progress, but some opportunities that exist. We also have data that looks at the 30-day post-acute care uh, measures. Uh, and again, if you extrapolate out to the percent of patients at 30 days that are receiving you know, similar therapies as we just identified for the inpatient measures, we can dive into that data review as well. And uh, again, we're, lack, we're lacking some of the robustness of the data that was, uh, for some of the metrics, as I'll show you. But for Milwaukee specifically, uh, Ace Arbor Arnie at 30 days is at 82 percent, uh, making some progress there, but below threshold. Beta, beta blockers. Again, one sec. I just got just got a call. I had, I had a breakaway. Can everyone hear me again? Lynn is yep, we can hear you. Again? Yep. All right, just making sure. Like, uh, so for 30 day beta blockers up at 97% compared to our baseline of 91%, 30 day aldosterone antagonism, uh, antagonist use 78% versus 65% so making some progress. Uh, RNA usage is up to 42% and social needs assessment is inching its way north from baseline of zero to 11%. Quadruple therapy, again, making uh, significant progress up to 47% now at 30 days and SGLT2 inhibitor for HFREF patients up to 40%. So this data set represents some more opportunities for the group um, and for our region to continue to push forward. Um, we've, uh, again, come a long way. I, again, I hate to you know, give everyone the message that we're, we're failing because we really have made sub substantial progress. Um, but, you know, in the mildly competitive space that we have, it's always been kind of a fun uh, comparison metric when we look at the other regions. There are others doing better than us, and you know, I think from a source of pride, I think we uh, we want to just be pack leaders as we've always been. Uh, so I'm optimistic that we'll continue to see improvements in many of these metrics. And I help, you know, the centers that are doing extremely well, help other centers that may be lagging to bring up the performance levels. When we look at the uh, Milwaukee versus seven region data, again, uh, quarter one, 2022 in gray, and the uh, seven region data in blue, Opportunities again leading for ACE Arbor Arnie, uh, doing very well for evidence based beta blocker. Uh, we're tied at the aldosterone antagonist usage, lagging somewhat for 30 day Arnie usage, a little bit behind for social needs assessment, doing ex exceedingly well on quadruple therapy uh, and doing uh, well on SGLT2 uh, usage for HFREF patients, lagging uh, the national data. But again, I think these. These trends identify that we are providing extraordinarily high quality care to our patients. Uh, and again, the opportunities are as you see them on the screen today. So if we look at the, the HEF PEF measures, these are relatively newer and again corresponds with much lower utilization. Uh, aldosterone antagonist use at the time of discharge for patients with preserved ejection fraction. Again, the data for the um, Milwaukee region is shown baseline. And you can see progression through quarter three to the more recent data set. Aldosterone usage remains low, but has recently seen a slight tick up. Uh, the SG, SGLT2 inhibitors, again, picking up a little bit of momentum, but still uh, kind of well below what we would, what we'd like to ideally see. Uh, RNA usage of discharge for those patients with HFPEF or mid-range ejection fraction still remains quite low. And then, then RB use for discharge uh, for patients with HFPEF or mid-range ejection fraction has been consistent with no clear signals that we're uh, moving that needle um, up any further. So we have some time, you know, for an open, you know, open discussion, but uh, I know Mary wanted want to just uh, share some insights and process from her side as well. Uh, again, if there's any questions specific to the data, I'm happy to try to address those. Otherwise, we can move forward with Mary and then come back to the data uh, with the open discussion. Thanks, Dr. Salzberg. Yeah. I'm not here. 
An absolute silence. <laughs> And we all have to show Anvil what a great collaborative group you all are. And we know that I am not a fan of silence. So we're going to turn it over to Mary and she's going to share some um, insights that her health system has really worked to improve since being a part of Implement HF and just share a little bit about um, quite a few of the processes that they've implemented. And then if you have any questions for Mary or Dr. Salzberg or others that are on the line, the whole point of um, the collaboration call is to be able to learn from each other. So feel free to ask questions of one another. Mary, we'll turn it over to you. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I guess Anvil just asked um, what we were doing at St. Luke's, particularly in improving our numbers. Um, I can say that as a system, we do work collaboratively with everybody throughout the system. We have monthly meetings with our abstractors, so we definitely share our strategies. Um, we work together collaboratively throughout the system um, in improving these numbers and coming up with solutions, um, sharing like what, what different practices that we can put in place. Um, some of the things that we worked at um, particularly is when the SGLT2 came about, our PNT committee um, initially they were limiting who could start that inpatient for an EF of less than or equal to 40. Um, but with communication and providing them the, the research through the American Heart Association, um, they've met and they've opened that up for the inpatient. So that definitely improved our numbers. I started at St. Luke's um, sending my fallouts for medications to our pharmacy um, just for validation and maybe recommendations. I know that they have ongoing education that they're providing to practitioners, so I think that significantly has proved um, very helpful. Um, we've invited include disciplines or um, management in any way, shape, or form that we feel that they would help with our measures. Um, we've provided educations with our um, SBARS, which is situation, background, assessment, and um, recommendations that we shared throughout the system. Um, we did update our, we had a best practice box that was had very low to no utilization. We did um, end of July come up with a smart phrase that allowed a little more flexibility for practitioners to use that tool if they felt it would help them to comply with our guideline directed medical therapy. Um, we updated our heart failure booklets um, across the system when we merged um, together with Advocate Aurora. Um, we also um, were instrumental in adding the, um, it's a smart uh, text that we can put in our AVS regarding the interactive um, heart failure booklet, which um, Donna Stradata is on the, on the call and was very instrumental with working with our system and getting that going. Um, we continue to report and work to work with staff in supporting quality improvement initiatives, research throughout the system. Um, and then again, abstractors meet monthly and we do continual education, communication. Um, we're starting our inner radar reliability on our, you know, our abstractions. Um, we continually um, reevaluate old and new measures just to make sure that we're consistent in what we're reporting and how we're abstracting that. Thank you, Mary. That was a fantastic summary of all of the great work that your site has been doing um, in regards to heart failure care. Uh, we really, really appreciate it and really appreciate you sharing. Does anyone have any questions um, on some of the things that Mary shared? Any more details that you would like to know? Are you working on similar things within your organizations? Well, we know we haven't solved all the problems because the data doesn't reflect that. So people, I'm hoping, will speak up. I'm hoping so too. I, of <laughs> course, when I was talking with Animal, I said, don't worry, this is not a shy group, but maybe we're in a, everyone's ready for the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to hear, um, and even if it's not in regards to specific things that are on um, the open discussion list here, anything that when you're looking at the data or what you're working on within your organizations, 
Is it is it similar to some of the things that Mary described? Are you using best practice boxes? Do you have inpatient order sets that include the quadruple medication therapy? Um, we as a team are looking at, you know, what can we do to help support all of you in this year three of the initiative? And so it would be great to hear from you what your barriers are, what your challenges are, um, as well as if you have any successes to share with the group that we can maybe help disseminate on a wider basis. Hi, this is Linda from Friedert. Uh, we have a supplemental order set for heart failure and uh, we're tracking how often that order set's being used because sometimes we're finding that um, the misses are related to people not using those specific order sets. And then um, as far as the outcome measures, um, Mary Conti is our program manager and we look, we review the cases every month for fallouts. And a lot of times what we're finding is it comes down to documentation. For the abstractors, if we can't find a reason why a particular medication wasn't given, you know, we have to abstract it as such. But, you know, if there's appropriate documentation, then we can take that. So sometimes it just comes down to better documentation, which I don't think is unique to our facility. Thanks so much for sharing that, Linda. And I think when we go through Query 5 results, you'll see exactly what you just mentioned. The documentation is one thing that came up um, you know, as a trend in some of the barriers to guideline directed medical therapy, that it's just standardizing that documentation of when it's not appropriate. Are we seeing provider documentation of the reasons why? I'm curious if anyone that's on the line has had a similar challenge of that documentation piece, and if you've done some things to overcome that. If there's Places within your order sets, like is there a hard stop that makes them document a reason why, or what are some other things that that you've done to overcome that? So this is Jennifer Niederstadt out at ProHealth, and I guess I um, I have a question for Linda as to how you actually get that supplemental order set used. We um, a few years ago tried to get a supplemental order set and it was not used at all and we struggle with getting uh, primary order set used because many of these people as you guys all know come in with other issues uh, whether it's AFib or MI or something else entirely and to get the use of that heart failure order set is has been extremely difficult so any any suggestions or how to get even the use of a supplemental order set in place, I would be really interested in hearing. Well, that's our challenge as well. And that's, um, unfortunately, Mary has a PTO day, day today, but um, she could better speak to that. Again, that remains our challenge. Um, and as far as um, one thing I wanted to add to what Lynn was saying was, um, Sometimes our physicians are a little bit more reluctant to order medications because they will look at a button and not specifically at the 2.0 or 2.5 um, level that American Heart um, recommends or according to the guidelines, but our physicians are a little bit more conservative. But it, again, it, we don't have the supporting documentation to say, that's exactly why they were withholding medication. So, but um, unfortunately, I can't help you out too much on that, the order set, but um, we can provide Mary Conti's email address and she could, she would be more than happy to help you out. Sure, thank you. I'm happy to reach out to Mary. Okay. I mean, Jennifer, I can, I can share with the group because Mary and I frankly wrote the order sets and tried to implement them. Uh, during my time at Freighter, you know, the, the key was linking it with a general order set, um, which is not easy still, but since hospitalists for the most part do, mo do a lot of the ordering and the residents, at least at Freighter, uh, we had to try to embed it uh, when you would put a general admission order set together and have it automatically sort of pop up and link 
uh, that still it wasn't a guarantee that someone would choose to use it, and many people would, you know, you can obviously modify the order, you know, the order set or get rid of it entirely. Uh, most, you know, most hospitalists, uh, they're not, it's not willful. I think they just have a, they have a workflow that they get very comfortable with that uh, doesn't include going and seeking out other order sets specifically, particularly when the heart failure diagnosis may be suspected but not confirmed. Uh, for, for some of the patients, as we know, that diagnosis evolves over the course of the hospital stay. So everywhere I've been, I've had, I've had a, just a challenging time getting order sets like this utilized. So if anyone has figured it out, you know, I've trying for 15, 20 years, um, not much success, but I'm, I'm always eager to learn. Thank you. I that's see why that. I asked the question because that's been my experience as well. Thanks, Jennifer, Linda, and Dr. Salzberg. I see that Mary has her hand up, so maybe she has the answer to it all. Mary, do you have the answers to it all? <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I did want to share that we are going to be starting a pilot. Um, Dr. John over at Sinai is very passionate about heart failure, and he wanted to come up with kind of a, like a discharge order set for heart failure. Um, so we're looking and investigating that. It, it looks like we were trying to see if we could have hard stops with that. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to be um, something that we can do, but we're looking into that. And we're hoping that we can start this in January. So we're looking at four sites, two sites in Illinois and two sites in Wisconsin to um, test pilot it. That's really exciting, Mary. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious just on the order sets when it looks like, it sounds like, you know, some of you are are tracking the adoption of that. If there is any um, in reinforcement from administration or on in using the order sets, like if it's written into physician performance review, um, if you're just kind of showing the data, if you show it down to the physician level, um, and if that's had any impact. Silence. I feel like this is a cell phone commercial looking at her pin drop. That's, that's, that's not All the right. goal here. So, <laughs> well, there, I will just say there is a capability of tracking um, order set usage and physician level in optional fields um, in Got With the Guidelines Heart Failure. So, I know we have some newer sites to Get With the Guidelines Heart Failure if you are. In need any help in in tracking that information and where to collect that data, um, Animal and I will be happy to walk you through how to do that. And then I think, um, you know, we are, when we look at, you know, what we're looking to talk about in our upcoming seven region calls, this is something I think that would be a great discussion point um, for that as well, to be able to see what other sites and other regions are doing to increase order set utilization. So I will add that to my list for future discussion. Anything else here in regards to the data that Dr. Salzberg shared? Um, any other questions you wanna ask of each other before we go ahead and look at some of the query data and then we can open it up for further discussion? Okay. And well, I'll turn it over to you if you want to go through. Um, um, we can skip over this one, but if you want to go through some of the Query 5 um, data results and maybe just some of the, the high level overview summary and we can have some discussion. I think that when we look at the, the quarterly data um, and we look at the Query 5 results, it sets, um, it, it paints the same picture and what we're talking about in regards to barriers from um, a provider perspective. And then this also will talk through patients. But what I would like for everyone to keep in mind is what would help you overcome some of these barriers? We've talked about the order set adoption, um, but also any other things that come to mind as, as we're reviewing this. So I will turn it to you, Anmol. 
Thank you, Lynn, and um, thank you all for participating in the Query 5 survey. We had about 19 folks that completed this, and um, again, we truly appreciate you all taking the time to help us to understand what barriers you're facing, um, whether that's due to health system or patient reasons. We have a few slides here that I'll run through pretty quickly, but we'll stop at the summary slide to deep dive a bit more. So um, the quadruple medication therapy, this was whether you're familiar with the inpatient discharge prescriptions and um, process and or um, do you abstract this data at your facility? So for the first one, 47% uh, said yes and 53 said no. And then the same question um, for the 30 day post discharge, 42 said yes and 58 said no. And um, in the earlier slide where um, there were there was a list of um, a few videos, their model, sh model share videos um, on abstracting the 30 day data. I would definitely recommend um, you review those. They're in the um, heart failure network, um, but I'm happy to share a link if you need that. So the common challenge we see here um, on the inpatient side is the lack of formal processes for providing patient education on medication, lack of standardized documentation, um, lack of provider knowledge regarding scientific rationale. For the 30-day um, health, we are seeing again lack of standardized documentation, challenges in, in identifying, and then information which is not provided. We'll see that similar throughout all of these. Um, this is the patient level reason for not prescribing. Again, co uh, communication challenges, limited access to medication refills, complex medication management. Um, on the 30 day, we see a similar um, three communication challenges, limited access to medication, and then complex medication management. For Arnie, we're seeing um, on the inpatient side, lack of formal process for providing patient education, um, challenges in identifying or designating primary provider accountable, lack of provider knowledge regarding um, scientific rationale on the 30 day, lack of standardized documentation, um, lack of provider knowledge, and then unable to determine patients um, compliance based on the data available. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly move through these next few slides and um, go to the summary slide just for the sake of time. But you'll see for MRA um, similar challenges across the board for SGL2. So the main themes seen throughout the query for this region um, on the inpatient is the lack of provider knowledge regarding scientific rationale for prescribing medicine, challenges in identifying or designating primary provider accountable for medication management, lack of standardized documentation option for not prescribing medication, and then on the 30 day, um, again, same, and then lack of system resource system staff to perform pre -aughts. Um, Is there anyone that are currently doing pre auts at your site? Um, anyone have any good processes that they'd like to share or any challenges that you've come across? Are there any challenges in identifying primary provider accountable for medi uh, medication management? Our systems out of curiosity, like getting direct feedback to providers. Are there point people who are charged with contacting a provider when there is a miss when they are abstracting? Thanks, Dr. Salzberg. I think you cut out just a little bit, but if I was hearing you correctly, I think you asked if there uh, was someone following up when a provider is, does not prescribe guideline directed medical therapy. Yeah, that's correct. Is there is there direct feedback to any providers to nudge them to do better next time? Hi, this is Kim. At Lakeland and Burlington, we do send an SBAR when we see misdocumentation of not prescribing those medications. And OSHA Thanks. does as well. Thanks so much, Kim and Donna. How long have you been using that process and has it been effective? We just started at Burlington Lakeland probably when I took heart failure over because that's what I did with sepsis. 
So we kind of moved that process over to heart failure. So I would say probably late July. Kenosha has always been doing that. I've always been doing that since um, I started abstracting and I've been doing it for about three years. That's a great process. Thank you. And is it who's responsible for giving that SBAR over to the provider? I do. I, I send an email and I usually include our um, physician quality director, my um, my actual quality director. Um, and um, the providers, I usually include the attending provider and the cardiologist. That's really helpful, Donna. Thank you. Um, Donna or Kim, is there a template that you would be willing to share with the group for when you send that over? Yeah, I actually don't have a template. I just kind of write it out for each patient. But I, okay. can, send, I can probably send I can send one that um, I've completed. That would be and great. Do, yeah, I do the same. I kind of write it out as um, so I don't have used a template, but I, I've been meaning to try to put one together. <laughs> If you got a chance, if either of you have something, you know, with the patient identifiers removed, that would be helpful to share with a group. I think that that's a really great process. Have you, are you able to tell us maybe if you've had any feedback from the providers on that and what that's been like? What is their response when they get the SBAR from you? Usually they send me an email saying back saying why the patient wasn't um, prescribed a say an RNA or, um, you know, um, an aldosterone antagonist, and I'll, I'll let them know that, you know, it needs to be documented in the chart. Okay, that's helpful. So it's another documentation piece. Usually that's what it is, is a documentation piece. So, and I also will put my, um, any fallouts um, in our patient safety event reporting so that, in, you know, it just shows transparency. That's great, Donna. Thank you. Hi, Lynn. I just have a question for Donna real quick on that, if that's OK with you and Anmal. Yeah, of course. Um, I was just going to ask Donna, who uh, who at your site kind of manages that process? Like, is it under quality or nursing? Like, is there a designated team member that does that kind of review and communication with the SBAR? So um, quality. We abstract, do the heart failure abstraction. I'm the only one that does it for our site. And then when I come across it, I do um, the SBAR and send it to the providers. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Donna and Kim. It, it sounds like that documentation piece is, you know, a recurring theme and we've talked through like the order set piece of it. Um, I'm also wondering, you know, one of the things that came up was the lack of provider knowledge regarding the scientific rationale. So I'm curious to dive in a little deeper on that one. If there are things that you think um, we could come up with together as a collaborative or, you know, from Implement HF overall and some educational pieces that maybe would help address that barrier. Are there like webinars, podcasts, conference, like would there be certain educational content that would be helpful for improving that provider knowledge? And I just want to share, I learned at the recent um, cardiac slap meeting, a lot of our physicians spoke up and they said that cost is a huge reason they do not prescribe. So we're trying to get help through our pharmacy. We have it um, in case management, they're working on that for like the pre auth now and trying to get financial help um, for our patients. So that was one of them that came out of that meeting that we're helping with. And then a lot of them do not feel comfortable. They said prescribing multiple new medications because most of our heart failure patients are in and out within three days. So for them to start them on, let's say, three new meds, um, they just said they do not feel comfortable doing that. Like they would like to start one, you know, see them within the seven to 14 days and then start another one and then maybe titrate to it. You know what I mean? So I think that's our biggest challenge at my two sites. That's really helpful, Kim. Thank you. I know the cost is something that I've also heard here and across the other six regions. Um, and we're really looking to share those, those pre-authorization model shares um, and help um, our patient engagement team is putting together 
um, a resource repository now of some different um, medication assistance programs. So we're working on compiling um, those resources to be able to share with this group. There's a few um, at the end of this slide deck, like Dispensary of Hope and Needy Meds, um, but we're working on and kind of getting a list um, pulled together as well. Um, I'm curious, Dr. Salzberg or um, Adam, if either of you are still on the line, if that's something that you experience at your sites as well in regards to prescribing multiple medications at the same time for a new patient and how maybe you've overcome that. I will command this feedback. I'm happy to weigh in as well. I don't know if it's just me, Dr. Salzberg, we're having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. Uh, you can switch out. Let me switch out and see if it's any better, okay? Sounds good. Bear with me once. While we're waiting for, oh, it looks like he's back. <laughs> is that is that any better? So much better, yes. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, you know, I, I don't hear a lot. I don't hear a lot of docs talking about costs in general. I think um, there's a general, you know, I guess reluctance, if you will, to uh, add in multiple meds at once that might impact blood pressure or kidney function. So, I think it's sometimes a sequencing problem um, and a timing problem. Uh, you know, there's no doubt that cost weighs into it, but I, I'm usually somewhat uh, agnostic to cost unless, you know, someone on the pharmacy team or gives me very specific feedback that the patient, you know, can't afford it or, you know, often the patient, I think in my experience, waits till they get to the pharmacy and then makes the decision, but that's usually not with my consultation. They're just, they're just there and they go, I can't pay $600 for a medicine. Uh, so... Certainly on the outpatient side, that's a challenge. On the on the inpatient side, um, you know, some of that's just formulary driven, I suspect. Um, but there's no, you know, so no doubt that, you know, but docs will just take their time introducing uh, each of these drugs sometimes because of you know, real or imagined concerns about blood pressure, kidneys. Thanks, Dr. Salzberg. And circling back to the cost, I think that's one of the reasons exactly what you described, Dr. Salzberg, is patients aren't always aware of what that cost may be until they're going to pick up their prescription. Um, and so I know that's why some of our sites are working on the pre-authorization process to give them an idea ahead of time, be able to connect them with resources. Um, is there anyone on the line that has worked through involving pharmacy, doing some of the pre-authorization on the inpatient side? Lynn, I haven't worked directly, but I know John Godin over at St. Luke's, I believe they're doing test scripts. And then I've been seeing documentation where they bring whatever the insurance will cover, whether it covers it or the percentage of what it covers, they will document if the patient declines it due to cost. Thanks, Mary. That's really helpful. I believe we're doing the same at Freightert. We're running the pre-auths. Um, and and I, I think this is a very important piece that the patient should be aware of it up front before they leave, um, how much the cost is going to be because if it's going to delay them either filling their prescription or standing at the pharmacy counter and then realizing they're up against a 400 or, you know, if they're on, sometimes if they're on both the um, ARNI and the SGLT, it can range anywhere from six to $800 for some folks per month. So that, that has to be an upfront discussion. So I think the issue can be resolved before they're discharged. Thanks, Linda. I think that's a really important point. Yeah, I don't know who's taking point on on that that process, though. I mean, I, I just never get feedback historically, you know, during the hospital stay as to what the cost is going to be for most of these medicines. So I assume a pharmacist is doing some of this, but um, if you're lucky enough to have a pharmacist as part of your day to day rounding team, that is likely to happen more consistently. But um, we we don't always. 
Do other centers have that resource or who's doing that uh, that work? Uh, we do have a pharmacist um, at Freighter. I believe they're trying to um, run that for the heart failure patients. And then we have some resources assigned to start working with the clinics on the outpatient because it's not just for the first 30 days, it, it would have to be for follow-ups as well. But again, you're, you're right. It is a matter of dedicating resources to this, um, you know, elevating the need for those FTEs. Thanks, Linda. Yeah. I think I mean, Dr. In a, per, in a perfect world, we'd have this, you know, as we often get in the outpatient side in Epic when I'm prescribing a drug, I get, you know, a, a notice, particularly for SGLT2 inhibitors, not on formulary, and I would consider other drugs, but that would uh, be an interesting Epic programming trick if they could decide on the inpatient side when you do a, prescribe a drug, if they ran it across the uh, patient's insurance to give you that feedback while you're prescribing. But I haven't seen, I haven't seen that. That could, that could be an Epic suggestion. Thanks, everyone. Great discussion there. Continued uh, challenge to, to work on for sure and continue to have discussion. Uh, I think the invite for today may have accidentally defaulted the Outlook way to 120, um, but if everyone's okay, we're going to continue to 130 like we normally do for the full hour. Um, and just if you need to hop off, we totally understand and we'll send out the recording. Uh, but I definitely appreciate the great discussion here. I think, um, Anmol, if you'd like, we can move on to the next slide. And we can go, um, yeah, we just wanted to take a moment to um, thank everyone for their participation at scientific sessions in Chicago in November. Um, we had great Implement HF presence there. Um, including two, three posters, sorry, one from Freighter and two from Advocate Aurora. So we really wanted to thank you all, all of the authors that worked so hard on those posters to model share um, and share their best practice with all of the um, attendees at scientific sessions. It was very cool to be able to be in heart quarters um, and have a special section for our quality showcase to have Implement HF posters represented. So thank you so much to um, those that were there, Advocate Aurora and Freighter, for submitting your posters. And um, some of you that are, are on and newer to the initiative, um, and those of you that have been there before, we will be um, attending scientific sessions again next year and hope to have a similar um, quality showcase and implement HF presence there to work on highlighting all of the great work that you do. And Anmol and I are happy to work with you on writing those posters. Um, so look forward to more opportunities like that. We also, I know Mary wasn't able to be on the line today, but wanted to thank her, uh, Mary Conti, for actually presenting at our uh, mini lecture series in Heart Quarter. Um, she presented on Implement HF and all of the great work that her organization has done to drive process improvement for heart failure patients. And also um, Linda Brunette Fighter for attending Quality Showcase to represent um, her freighter poster. We also had some um, folks on the advocate side of Advocate Aurora representing their two posters there too. So again, thank you to all of you um, for working so hard on improving heart failure care and, and sharing your expertise in platforms like scientific sessions. You want to go to the next slide, Animal? And just a reminder to everyone about the Implement HF network. If you have not yet joined, it's a great place to connect with one another. We have all of the model shares um, posted there now. Um, all of the previous collaboration calls and this one will be posted there and all of the patient resources um, are posted there as well. So if you're not yet a member, please reach out to Ann Mull and I and we would be happy to add you. And then Ann Mull, do you want to share some of the upcoming events and reminders? 
Absolutely. Um, so the next seven region collaboration call um, is scheduled for January 24th from 12 to 1 15 p.m. If you have not received um, the invite, please send me an email and I'll be happy to forward that to you. For Heart Failure Awareness Week, um, our team is working on an abstraction course. Once I have additional details on that, um, I will be happy to share that with you. Award data review and uh, deadline. I will go into more detail on the upcoming slides on this. And then um, if you need a refresher or if you missed the get with the guideline heart failure impact of the new heart failure guidelines by Dr. Fonero, I've in included a link to the recording here. Um, we have an exciting holiday challenge between the seven region, um, the patient engagement survey. Now through January 20th, um, we are challenging all implement heart failure sites to submit as many patient engagement surveys as possible. First of all, um, survey participants will receive up to $35 in Amazon gift cards for completing the surveys. Participating sites in the region with the most submissions will receive 50 copies of each of the patient discharge booklets and the guideline pocket cards. A challenge um, dashboard is posted on the Implement Heart Failure Healthcare Network and updated weekly, so um, you can keep track there. Right now, um, as you can see, North Carolina is in the lead, so I challenge you all to use some of these suggestions to increase um, surveys. Uh, some include the sur survey link and discharge materials and remind patients of the gift cards for completing. You could post the survey QR code in a high traffic visible area or um, encourage patients to complete survey prior to discharge. Any questions there? Um, I am encouraging everyone to please complete all 2022 inpatient data um, entry by mid-February. The earlier data completion allows us time for patient outlier review and um, correcting any potential errors, preventing your site from achieving recognition. The official deadline is March 31st um, for completing January through December 2022 data. Um, again, if you missed Dr. Fonero's webinar, uh, the link is here. Anything else you want to add here, Lynn? I think just real quick, Anmol, that um, you said it beautifully that we just want to make sure that when sites have their 2022 discharges entered, if you can just reach out to Anmol and we will be happy to meet with you all to review, you know, we'll run the Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure Reports like we usually do um, and go through and see um, if you're qualifying for award status or not and review any outliers with you. So if you can just reach out to us whenever 2022 data entry is complete, it would be much appreciated. The deadline is the same for those of you that have worked um, and get with the guidelines heart failure for a while. Um, we just try to touch base mid-February because that March 31st is doesn't allow for any changes after that. Thanks, Animal. Thank you, Lynn. Um, the next couple of slides I won't go through um, as they've been presented in the earlier learning collaborative calls, but um, they are there to serve as a reminder of the resources that we have. I'll also send a copy of this deck out to everyone so you have those slides. Um, and before we end the call, I wanted to get a little bit of feedback on your thoughts of holding a in-person learning collaborative call either in the spring or summer. Um, I know Dr. Salzberg and I discussed this and we thought that it'd be great to get everyone um, in an in-person meeting, but would love your thoughts on that. This where we can call on people directly by looking you in the eye. Any additional questions for Lynn, Dr. Salzberg's or I? I see that Mary said yes to in person. And I, if for those of you that may not be familiar, I did mention we will feed you. It's usually something good. Um, we can take input on menu items, but it's usually really nice um, when we were able to meet quarterly in person before with our previous heart failure initiative for all of you to be able to connect with one another, um, take some time. I know it's difficult to do so, but outside of your day dedicated to just this um, opportunity to connect with one another and have some in-person collaboration. So if you don't feel comfortable um, sharing in the chat, if you want to send an email over to Animal, if your preference, if it's spring or summer, um, what you would prefer in terms of an in-person meeting, um, we can take it from there.
Thank you, Lynn. Um, again, I'll follow up shortly with the recording and the deck. Um, if anyone else has any more questions, please let me know via email or I'll stick on for a little bit longer. But happy holidays and thank you all for um, joining this call today. Thanks so much, Anmol, and thanks, Dr. Salzberg, and all of you that joined. I really appreciated the contributions to the discussion today. Thank you, Lynn and Anmol as well for uh, leading us, and um, I can appreciate those who spoke up, um, and, and certainly appreciate each side for participating and taking the time and effort to try to make hard for their care better in our community. So thank you all. Thanks, thanks so much for your leadership, thank Dr. You. Salzberg.